Welcome back to the Developer Landscape series. In this series, I cover topics related to developer tools. These tools help developers get the job done with higher quality and convenience. If you're picking up this series in the middle, you can clone the examples from this series from GitHub. To do this, open the bit.ly link on your screen in your browser, and this will take you to the GitHub repo. You can clone the code by clicking on the clone or download button. The GitHub URL that you see may start with HTTPS and that's fine. Just copy the contents to your clipboard. In your terminal, change to a working directory. I like to put all of my source code in a directory called SRC. Type git clone and paste the GitHub URL and finally hit enter. And now to the show. In the previous episodes in this mini-series, I've covered testing tools. Now we'll move on to troubleshooting tools. With each one of these episodes, I seem to have to caveat what I'm going to cover. And so here's my caveat for this one. Uh, in this episode, I'm primarily going to walk through troubleshooting tools that relate to REST APIs and web UIs. A basic set of those tools include Postman, Curl, and Browser Dev tools. So I'll cover those. So when do you face situations where you need to troubleshoot your program? Well, mainly when your program isn't working how you or your customer are expected. Before we even get into the technology, in order to troubleshoot, you might consider writing down steps that reproduce your issue. This is good for sharing with other teammates or so on. Since I'm sure you'll be writing tests for your program, uh, once you figure this uh, problem out to the issue, you should try to codify the issue in a test case or series of tests. This will help keep you from introducing regressions or issues that you fixed but come back later at some later date. Okay, the first tools that we'll look at are Curl and Postman. These tools are really useful for troubleshooting REST API calls. Not only are they useful for troubleshooting, they're also helpful for learning and trying out an API just to figure out its behavior. Sometimes APIs don't have full documentation. Um, perhaps the docs are out of date. So just trying out the API with one of these tools can help you figure out where the variations are without writing any code. So going to the example program that calls the Chuck Norris joke API, we can take a look at the test, test underscore Norris underscore bad key. Perhaps our API used to return a data structure that contained the results in a key called data. You can see in our test, we're navigating the, the dictionary with data and then value. But now it throws an error when it runs. The error displayed is pretty clear, a uh, key error and data. So it used to work, but now it doesn't. Since the error is related to the data returned, you then want to figure out what the JSON actually looks like now. You can turn to curl and postman in this situation. So let's start with curl. Curl is a common placed Unix program. Like most Unix utilities, it does one thing and one thing well. According to uh, the man page here, it does the work of transfer data to or from a server. You can use curl to perform HTTP requests to a URL. It supports a host of other protocols in addition to HTTP, but for our purposes, HTTP and HTTPS are what we care about. Okay, so how does curl help us in this situation troubleshoot our issue? So let's look at the services.py file um, and grab the URL for the test case that failed. It's failing in the get joke method. And so we can copy and paste the URL from there into our shell and just type curl and paste that URL. The result is the JSON that the server returned. You can see that the data structure does not have that data key anymore. Now there are a lot of options that you can use with curl. Some of the more common ones are dash V for verbose and dash S dash capital D, uh, which shows headers in the body. So with dash V, uh, it's nice because it shows the headers sent and received. Uh, the dash S dash capital D, uh, it displays headers and body uh, that it received only. That extra dash in the, the, this last example is a sort of Unixism. Uh, dash capital D actually is intended to dump headers to a file. The dash will make it so that the output will be displayed in standard out as opposed to the file. 
Let's say you want to post some data to a server. You would use a few different flags, dash capital H to set the headers, dash capital X for the HTTP verb, dash lowercase d for the data in the body, and finally the URL. In this example, we'll send a login to the apicem devnet sandbox via the command line. There are a couple more examples in the sample code for this series under the testing-troubleshooting folder, so feel free to try them out as well. Now, some of you out there prefer a UI. In this case, many of the same capabilities you find in curl are available in a really popular tool called Postman. Postman's UI is fairly intuitive. Uh, on the left-hand pane, you have history or saved collections of URLs. Uh, this can be handy, the saved collections part, if you like to create um, tests or test suites. Um, so Postman kind of can do a little bit of troubleshooting and testing. Um, but also the collections feature can also be handy for demos uh, when you don't have a UI to rely on. You can see that there's a spot to put your URL and pick your HTTP verb, and after that, um, you just click Send. If we look at the result in this case, we can see that the data structure for the response does not match what we were expecting, kind of like the other example. Um, and again, the, um, the response object does not contain uh, the data key. So now we know what the issue is in our, um, in our test. Okay, so let's switch gears uh, and look at some tooling that exists in web browsers. Uh, a long time ago, there was an add-in to Firefox called Firebug. Um, it was an in indispensable tool for web developers. And it was so indispensable that now all the leading browsers have added that kind of functionality into um, their developer tools area. We'll start with Firefox and also take a look at Chrome. So far in this series, uh, we haven't hit a lot of web development tools, but it's worth showing a little bit of what's available in browsers, because uh, you may find it useful later on. In either Chrome or Firefox, the dev tools are sort of mini applications that help you look behind the scenes of what's going on on the web page. Um, and this will help you do a lot of troubleshooting and debugging. They have features like um, being able to inspect elements on a page and see what code is behind it, uh, view JavaScript in a console, and view the source of the page, uh, network security, performance, lots of different things. Because more and more web front ends are JavaScript based, um, so examples of those are like React, Angular, Vue.js, and so on, you'll find the inspection and console to be very handy not to mention the JavaScript deb debugging uh, if you're building a web app. Some frameworks like React uh, have their own developer tools that will snap into Chrome or Firefox's tools. Let's take a look at the Firefox tools. You can see that um, I'm on the DevNet homepage. We'll use it for some examples. To open the Dev Tools in Firefox, navigate to the Tools menu and then Web Developer. This opens a pane alongside the browser content itself. You can move it around uh, to be at the bottom, the side, or you know, in a standalone window by itself. There are a whole bunch of controls in front of us. Inspector, console, kind of like I mentioned before. Uh, we'll start with the inspector. Um, we're not going to hit all of these. Um, we're just going to hit inspector and console. Uh, if I click on it, you can see that the HTML that makes up the web page is displayed. I can enable the inspector um, by clicking on this little icon over here and hover over various elements on the page itself. Heading up to my login name and clicking on it, you can see that it drops me to a specific div. Now, I can navigate the div a little bit and get to where my initials and my name are. I can edit anything here uh, and it will be updated in the page. So I'll change AR to CR uh, and you'll see that it's updated. Uh, I can delete the classes and the styling goes away. These are only temporary. If I reload the page, it resets it. This can be handy to troubleshoot styling issues, for example, where I can directly edit the styles on the right hand side. If I flip over to console, uh, you have full access to the JavaScript language, as well as the JavaScript loaded in the page itself. So if I type uh, in window.open and then https colon slash slash cisco.com and hit enter, 
Um, Firefox prevents it from opening, but you can see that that's just a generic JavaScript command that you might uh, you might implement on your own. So this page is written in React. Uh, I also have the React plugin installed. Uh, this is a tool that is maintained by the React project and is a plugin into the developer tools. It helps you troubleshoot React-based sites, like you might expect. Um, like the inspector, the React tool allows you to pick an element and see its React properties. You can see there's a React component called Connect. I can click down to it, uh, to it and see the component T and all of its properties. Uh, the component T thing, uh, that's because uh, this is a production version of that code, and so it uh, obfuscates all the variables and stuff. So um, that's why it says T instead of like an actual understandable variable. I'll point your attention though um, to the result array in the properties pane. If I do a search on say SDKs, then you'll see the array gets populated. Um, and so where did those terms come from? Well, a web service. Uh, if I flip over to the networks tab and I scroll down, you can see the search API that was being called by React. We can uh, look at the response that came back from the server, and so you can see some of the data that exists in that uh, dropdown above. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing quickly using Chrome DevTools and uh, I'll just do this kind of in fast forward. You can see that the experience is pretty much identical. Both Google and Mozilla have good tutorials if you want to dive in deeper into the capabilities of their dev tools. So that's it for this mini series on testing and troubleshooting tools. Uh, these are common tools that developers use when building applications, both to troubleshoot as well as to ensure that they're building good quality projects. All right, we've come to the end of another episode of the Developer Landscape series. If you want to try out some of your new skills, head over to Cisco DevNet at developer.cisco.com. You can also stay in touch with me or ask questions via Twitter at A Roach. Also, follow DevNet on Twitter at Cisco DevNet to keep up with our latest adventures. Thanks for watching.